Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we are in the home stretch at this current point. I'm showing you right now the plush, the cyborg plush. The one's available right now through Makeship. If you look in the description down below, that's all that's there, it's just a plush. We are currently 20% away from being able to make gold. I'd really like to be able to make gold, that way everybody's able to get these plushes. If we don't make gold, unfortunately, everyone gets refunded and these will never be made. I will own the only one in history. So if you want to get a late Christmas gift for yourself or somebody else, click the link in the description down below. You can get your hands on this MCP Cyborg plush. Click the link, give it a shot, see if you like him. And now, on to tonight's story. Dear friends, I hope the term I use doesn't cause you any concern. Some would likely not want a pagan medium as a friend and... If so, I don't wish any harm on them. It's just that at this point, I feel like I've grown close to my audience, to the point that I worry for their safety. What happens to me over the holidays has left my faith in humanity shaken. Discovering the wicked deeds that self-proclaimed men of cloth performed with the backing of their devout followers. It's made me question if I can even truly have a home for the holidays again, especially as I draw close to the truth but the horrible secrets this town hides. Every new story tells of a darkness that's boiled up from hell itself, I feel, and nothing could prove this more than what the deacon told me about the gifts he had seen young Lydia carried. As I listened, I understood some part of his own journey, whether I consider his behavior to be righteous or not, and I am not one to judge others. I must make that clear. I feel that the actions can easily allow justice to fall where it is suited. The third incident. Holy Shadows. It's time you heard of what happened to Father Josiah, the deacon said as his altar boys hastily locked the doors and windows of the church. They carried Lydia towards a small pew in the front where the choir often performed, and Haverson was putting out the candles, making the room pitch dark. The howling of the woods continued, made my entire body shake. The girl began to display her gift on that first day coming into the church. As she told you this, she told me how you forced her into a baptism, I commented softly. And rightfully so, given what happened next. As we discovered her body was filled with spirits, demonic presence that was trying to use her as a vessel for this world, Harrison said. That same demon now walks in these woods, but attacking the people of our small town trying to drag them to hell. Father Drew found out about it a few nights before your arrival. We, we were having a mass here, helping people in town to gain healing from Lydia when he returned from his mission. He came to the church foyer covered in blood and spouting nonsense. Immediately I ordered two of the altar boys to help him, help him stand upright, get him on the stage. The entire congregation needed to hear of what had happened. His eyes were wild, his body hardly able to maintain his own weight as I gave him some water and allowed him to eat sacrament. He had nearly calmed down, but then he saw Lydia there in the front pews. She had fallen into a coma. Often this happens whenever she's exhausted her gifts a bit too much, and I had advised the church that this is a sign from God that he is resting his hands the same way he does upon the Sabbath. But when Father Drew saw her, he screamed. Tried to curse her, to be honest. It was a striking proclamation coming from this holy man, but then, then he calmed down again and explained what was wrong. He told us that he could sense that the girl had recently gone into the land of spirits. How, I can't tell you, but Father Drew has never been wrong about this before. As proof of this, he told us of the shadows that lurked in the woods. Claimed they came from the girl herself. When she sleeps, the shadows move around and devour holiness. He even called them agents of the devil. The wounds he sustained were from these monsters, and he warned if we didn't act quickly, the entire town would be in danger. Seeing as so many of us had seen our first miracle, we were having a test of faith. And some even recommended stoning Lydia. It was my decision to lock her away. Her gift is too powerful to simply be tossed aside because of the darkness that rests in her. I mulled over what he told me. 
watching as the strange shadows moved on the exterior of the church. They don't come on holy land. It's safe here. So it is for everyone. But the town. Are they all informed? I asked. He bit his bottom lip. It's sometimes better to keep a predator fed, he whispered. Even the devil has a role to play. I had my disgust. Instead, opting to find out more about this creature if I could. I think Father Drew died of his injuries. The deacon, however, no longer seemed interested in sharing the stories to me. Instead, some that took the church a shelter were asking how they could protect themselves from the beast at the door. And Haverson suddenly changed his friendly to dangerous. The reason I tell you all this is because I want to prove to my congregation that you are a child of God. It is true the beast will not harm you, and you will be able to walk through our streets untouched. However, we are risking everything by allowing you to keep living if you are in fact the spawn of Satan. Suddenly several grown men were pushing me to the door. The howling was becoming more intense, and I was being shoved into the open air. Deacon Haverson shouted out, Believe in the Lord and his powers will save you from the jaws of death. Let this test of faith prove your validity as the saint and not a witch. I feel the air around me beginning to grow colder as I pushed back towards the door, but the men, the men had already kicked me out. They were determined to follow this dark ritual to its bitter end, even if it meant my life was in danger. It occurred to me that Father Drew was likely fed to the beast for a similar reason. The church were certain that keeping Lydia alive was more vital than stopping this hell beast, and my death would only encourage them to keep their sick fantasy of being blessed perpetrated even further. I moved towards the outer gardens, listening and watching to see what the shadows would do. Every whisper in the air made my hair stand on edge, and I closed my eyes to focus, use my gifts that they thought were from the devil, and find this beast didn't take long. As the unseen became a reality to me, I realized the creature stood at the edge of the church's grounds. It was surprisingly small compared to the images I had conjured up, a living shadow that did not enter holy ground. I approached it slowly, trying to get a better grasp on what it was and where it had come from. It was like looking at a dark reflection of Lydia and the aura around the being told me that this alter self was embodying her desires, her anger, her fears. I offered my hand to it, hoping that it would understand I meant no harm. In response, it showed me the reality of what had happened to Father Drew. Smoke filled my mind, and pictures formed around me as time seemed to reverse itself. Flashing images of the deacon and his faithful came up as they dragged Father Drew out of his own church. I screamed. It was Lydia. She wanted to protect him. Instead, the church was insisting that he be done away with. He wants to end our miracle. But we have come too far to stop now. We are blessed to have this day, this season of mirth, and no one shall stop us, Deacon Haverson proclaimed. They broke his skull right at the edge of the church grounds, hoping the shadow beast would eat up what remained. Father Drew had suggested they exorcise the demons from Lydia, save her immortal soul. In response to the thought of losing their precious little slave, the church turned on him, hoping the devil would see fit to tear him apart. What happened next? Show me, I demanded the shadow. In response, it ran into town, whisking its way between buildings. I chased after it. I didn't even dare to imagine if Haverson or his worshippers were following. It was leading me to a large banquet hall that appeared abandoned. Inside, I saw a massive Christmas tree, decked out with all sorts of ornaments, but it was immediately clear it hadn't been used in quite some time. The shadow crept across the floor to the stairs, guiding me downward. As I approached the steps, I felt my stomach lurch. Since my arrival, I had searched for an answer to what's causing this here in this tranquil town. I knew as I descended to the basement of this once festive building, I was about to come face to face with the answer. There was a presence here. And for once, I realized Deacon Haverson was correct. I felt no aura, no sense of the spiritual world, just a dark, endless void. 
and it beckoned me to come and see its glory. We're coming around the bend to holidays, which means that I'm going to tell you guys about a book. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to tell you guys about two books. The Creative Pasta Collection, Volume 1 and Volume 2. It's available on Amazon right now. You can find a link to it in the description down below, and they are books that are curated by me. They're a couple years old, but recently one of them got published in Japanese, which is interesting. I don't think you can buy it, but, I mean, if you're in Japan and you see it, I, I hope you think. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. That includes everybody who's been waiting for me to update my Patreon, and I thank you all so, so much for being so patient with me. But especially, I want to give a thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Chance Burnett, Donna Krause, Tristan Pelton, Acid System, Adam Garrick, Aaron Stormcrow, Ika Limchalk, Amber Clark, Angelus, Atomorous, Bastion Beefcake, Blue the Enigma, Braden Morris, Broken Beast 320, Captain Scurvy, Caspian, Shelly J, Cory Kenshin, Cronut 509, Crusader Chocobo, Cryptic Nightmares, Curse Pox Primark, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Daniel Paulson, Darth Myver, Deleted Account, Dirt Diver 030, M, Esteban, Fester's Lampshade, Freddy Krueger, Gorag Tri Magazine, Grand Moth the Milky, Hades Nephew, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Harley, Himbo Jerry, Horseman Sec Time, Insanity Gamer X, Jay Cairns, Jesus Cornell, Jordan Humble, Justin LaFontaine, Kaylee Ambrose, Kiri the Sloth, Crazy Kid, Cryolinian, Lambda M98, Lisa Cottrell, Little Crow, Lord Life's Best, Lupita Galvin, Love You Eminem, Matt Bach, Melted Lake, Michael Allen Jr. Bashirs, Mike, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Nate Cull, Nico Kayo, Psychomo, Red Shadow Cat, Rob Like Sharp Things, Sam Ahai, Sashi Sasaku, Seclude, Stricken, Tali Sue, Tater Chip, That Creepy Chick, The Ginger Bros, Turtle Man, Voice of Sand, William King, Xavier and Cheyenne, Yargul, and Zachary Graphius. If you would like to join this list of names that I horribly mispronounce, then please head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, or you can always check out the names in the description down below, and I appreciate it infinitely. So thank you all on Patreon, thank you all so, so much, and to everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>